What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so as we continue on with Captain America, Steve Rogers, um, again, this is just some amazing storytelling coming from Nick Spencer, but it's been a little while since we covered this, this story. So what I wanna do is, is provide a little bit of a refresher for those people who are joining us for the first time or, or those people who have kind of forgotten. That's kind of the price you pay when you start going over stories that come out monthly is, uh, I don't know about you guys, but you know, if I have to wait six months to finish a story, I'll forget what happened in the first issue. That's one of the reasons why I kind of like what DC Rebirth is doing by releasing stories bi-weekly, but the fact remains here that with uh, with Steve Rogers, the Steve Rogers that we've known, the Captain America that we've known for really for years and years and years and, you know, for decades, uh, was always just a champion of freedom in the United States. You know, he had undergone the Super Soldier Project at the hands of Dr. Abraham Erskine uh, around the time of World War II. He was enhanced from a, you know, sickly, lanky guy into a masculine, you know, a pretty huge guy, which was kind of indicative of what was considered to be a man's man at that point in time in, in comic books in the 1960s. And uh, in the the result was that Steve Rogers went forward fighting on behalf of the Allied powers. Of course, we know that eventually he succumbed to a uh, to an explosion of a drone plane at the hands of Baron Zemo. Ultimately, he was frozen alongside Bucky Barnes, who was captured by the Russians. Uh, that led to Steve Rogers being thawed out and eventually discovered by the Avengers. And of course, he became a superhero, you know, as we know him for however long you've been reading Marvel Comics. So because of that, uh, what Nick Spencer did is he turned the entire landscape on its head. And what he did with Avengers standoff is uh, we basically saw a story where a cosmic cube, really uh, I guess fractions of different cosmic cubes over the years, were brought together to form a singular cosmic cube. And like all cosmic cubes that have ever existed in the history of Marvel Comics, this cube became sentient and adopted the name Kavik. And that's usually what happens. Cosmic cubes, if allowed to exist long enough, will develop a sentience and actually become beings, become different, you know, organisms. Sometimes they'll take on an alien form, but this one, Kavik, was basically a young girl. Now the reason why the cosmic cube became a young girl is because it was designed to reflect the fact that this cosmic cube was essentially newly created and so its existence reflected the fact that like a young child it was still learning about itself it was still learning what it was capable of now following avengers standoff Kavik, the cosmic cube was just basically thrown onto the thunderbolts team and all marvel did with that was basically just kind of keep her in stasis kind of keep her as a holdover and keep her around so that when secret empire comes to an end presumably when it comes to an end anyway steve rogers can be returned back to the way he was before by way of Kavik, the cosmic cube that's the most likely ending to that story I'm, I can't guarantee it is an absolute certainty because I don't know the future so <laughs> so because of that what Nick Spencer has been doing over the course of Captain America Steve Rogers is going through and basically showing us what the updated origin what the new origin for Steve Rogers is after his past was modified by the Red Skull now because of the fact that his history was changed traditionally Steve Rogers you know having undergone the super soldier process by Abraham Erskine instead what this does is this shows us he was raised by Hydra and because he was raised by Hydra Hydra, what ended up happening is he was sent to the United States as a Hydra agent for the purpose of killing Dr. Abraham Erskine. Now, initially, all we really knew was that he was just a bad guy operating behind the scenes, but we didn't really know how deep things went. What this story tells us is that he had fulfilled his mission, arriving in the United States, basically, you know, gaining an audience with Abraham Erskine, demonstrating the fact that Steve Rogers himself was the best candidate for the super soldier process because Erskine was looking for somebody with a good moral heart, somebody who was able to do the right thing when it was necessary and of course this was a ruse that Steve Rogers was putting on but ultimately he was selected now with the selection process because of the fact that Abraham Erskine never kept notes and because of the fact that all the information of the super soldier process was in his head what this did is it created a difficult situation because then the question became what happens is Steve Rogers going to become the super soldier as he normally did or is he going to fulfill his mission kill Abraham Erskine before he becomes a super soldier and if that happens how does he become the Steve Rogers in terms of his agility, strength, speed, so on and so forth that we're the most familiar with. And so again, this kind of bounces back and forth a little bit. And what it does is it transitions to the funeral of Jack Flagg. Now keep in mind, one of the first indications here that Nick Spencer gave us that Captain America's history had been modified and he was transformed into a Hydra agent was that he had basically killed Jack Flagg. And again, this really goes towards the evil nature of Steve Rogers. Something else that I want to focus on here is the difference between Hydra and Nazis. One of the biggest 
biggest misconceptions out there from people who don't read Marvel comics is that Hydra and the Nazis are the same thing. That's actually completely wrong. It's wrong on a lot of different levels. There's the Nazis, which is the Nazis as you know them, led by Adolf Hitler, so on and so forth. Hydra is a wholly different organization. Hydra looked at the Nazis and said, they're going about it all the wrong way. They're basically trying to conquer the world through conventional warfare. Hydra, as it was formed, or really as it was uh, reinstated by Baron von Strucker, because Hydra existed some, you know, one or 2,000 years before the Nazi party ever came into existence, Hydra, as it was reformed by Baron von Strucker, was designed to exist behind the scenes. It was designed to be this hidden hand, much like the Japanese ninja organization, the hand itself, or something along those lines. Hydra was designed to exist behind the scenes and basically subvert governments across the world to essentially implement their own method of, of taking over the globe by virtue of just schemes and, you know, cloak and dagger tactics and things like that. So that's the huge difference. The Nazis just wanted to eradicate anybody who wasn't, you know, part of the Aryan race. Hydra was a far more clandestine and a far larger and more overarching organization outside of the Nazis. So that's why I say I wanted to kind of offer that real quick because again, it's usually a misconception that's held by people who don't really read Marvel comics. But because of this, with the death of Jack Flagg, remember, Captain America is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. right now and people don't know that he's a Hydra agent. No one really knows what's going on. All they know is the face that he puts on, which as far as they're concerned, Captain America is a champion of freedom, you know, a champion of liberation, different things like that. And so with this, uh, this funeral more or less coming to an end, what this is designed to do is show us that Captain America, I guess Steve Rogers, is going through the process of moving things in a direction, more or less moving chess pieces to solidify his intention to basically form his regime, to form his secret empire. And so because of this, you know, of course, he speaks with Peter Quill. He speaks with a few people here and there. But the idea of Carol Danvers championing this device that's going to create a barrier around the planet Earth to make sure that extraterrestrial threats cannot invade the planet is still something in existence. And keep in mind, the reason why that idea was even launched in the first place was because of the fact that Steve Rogers engineered an invasion by the Tatari army on the planet Earth. And so we literally set things in motion. And that's how Captain America Steve Rogers works. This is how he works as a Hydra agent because it's a reflection of how Hydra functions. What Red Skull does, what Red Skull's doing right now in Marvel Comics, that's a reflection of the Nazi party. Basically, conquest through warfare. What Steve Rogers does is he says, let's move pieces around the board. No one's going to know that I'm the one that does it. Anybody who gets close to my identity is going to be killed. But instead of simply saying, instead of going out to the world and saying, as the director of Hydra, I believe we should make a giant barrier around the planet Earth. Instead, he engineers an invasion from the Jatari army. The people begin to panic. The government responds. And under the direction of someone else, under the, under the idea of Carol Danvers, the implementation of a you know global barrier is put into play. And so again, Steve Rogers gets what he wants. He gets this barrier that keeps anybody from leaving or anybody from, from coming to planet Earth without express permission of S.H.I.E.L.D. So again, it's basically Steve Rogers putting himself in a position where he can make himself absolute ruler of the world. That's really where this is going in. And that's why I say there's differences between Hydra and, and the Nazis just because of the fact that it's not about, you know, eliminating everybody that's not of a particular group. It's about just taking over the world, about ruling over everybody equally. So I guess you could say that Steve Rogers is like an equal opportunity dictator, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but the fact remains that switching back to his origin story again, this is where Steve Rogers goes to visit Dr. Abraham Erskine. And this is really the moment of truth for his character. And the reason why is because when Abraham Erskine and Steve Rogers are conversing with one another, by this point, they formed a friendship, much like a mentor and a student. And so because of this, you know, when his guard is down, when Abraham Erskine invites Steve into his house, Steve begins the process of fulfilling his mission of killing Abraham Erskine. Now, while this happens, he also basically speaks directly to somebody that we can't see. He's talking to somebody off screen or off panel, basically saying the time has come. You know, time is basically running short. Things are moving faster than I anticipated. And because of that, our timetable has been sped up. We need to begin moving things in a quicker direction. The issue that he faces is that Steve Rogers is just one man. And what he needs is an ally on his side that can corral forces to the side of Steve Rogers while Steve Rogers himself continues the guise of being a champion of freedom in, you know, in the superhero community and still trying to move pieces around. And so because of this, we jump back to his past again. And this is when Abraham Erskine, you know, again, tries to tell Steve Rogers, look, you can't do this. This is not who you are. Now, this is when we start to see the conflicting nature of Steve Rogers. And this is really something that I'd hope you notice here. In the modern day, when his character is talking to people, when we see his darker half, there is no conflict. There is no struggling to understand his place. There is no question of whether or not what he's doing is right. He is absolutely sure that he's making the right decision. And so the question becomes, what happened between then and now? What event or series of events took place that moved Steve Rogers from where he is in his origin story to being unsure of whether or not he should actually kill Dr. 
Dr. Abraham Erskine to being where he is now, where he knows that what he's doing is absolutely right, and all the decisions that he's made over the course of his history were worth it. Not only that, because of the fact that Steve Rogers in his past is very weary, very unsure about whether or not he can actually bring himself to kill Erskine when the shot's fired, we end up learning that the killing shot actually came from Helmet Zemo. So again, this is a reaffirmation of the fact that Zemo and Steve Rogers have long since been friends for quite some time. Now, of course, following this, Zemo basically grabs some device that was created by one of uh, one of Hydra scientists, slaps it on the head of Abraham Erskine, absorbs his knowledge, and calls it a day. Now, the funny thing about this is that if you're not a reader of, of Marvel Comics, or really not a reader of comics as a whole, this would basically come off as a throwaway device, and that's exactly what it is. I mean, this is basically something that's just done for the sake of necessity. But what it's also designed to do is hit home to the idea that this is a very primitive level of technology in the sense that it's not like it is now. Telepaths were not widely known to exist around the era and before the era of World War II. Remember, it was because of the formation of the Avengers that the USSR began the process of rounding up superheroes and Colossus came into play. It wasn't until the 1960s that Charles Xavier formed the X-Men. And so with these set of events taking place some 15 or 20 years prior, superheroes were not as widely prominent and not as well known as they came to be later on down the line. And so again, they're basically just kind of using whatever's available to them in order to, to gain the memories of Abraham Erskine. But what we also find out is that Arnim Zola has been rolled over into Hydra itself, is still loyal to Hydra, and because of his expertise in the realm of science, intends to basically consolidate all the information of Abraham Erskine and then basically implement the super soldier program under Hydra itself. And so because of this, what ends up happening is Helmut Zemo basically says, look, Rogers, you're supposed to be the super soldier here. You're supposed to be the, the main star of this project. The United States, the allied powers believe that they're that you're on their side. They have to maintain this belief. And so you have to be the one who stumbled in and discovered the body. You have to be the one who's devastated by the death of Dr. Abraham Erskine. Again, this is how dark this story gets in terms of what his origin is. But what ends up happening is we find out that in the modern day, this person that Steve Rogers is talking to is Helmut Zemo. And this is how Nick Spencer squares the circle. One of the big questions that people have had is when the history of Steve Rogers was altered by this cosmic cube, did it alter the entire history of the universe or did it just alter the life of Steve Rogers? What Nick Spencer does here is confirm that it only altered the life of Steve Rogers, no one else. Everybody else's history in terms of the history of Marvel Comics remains intact. The only history that's changed are the individuals that we've seen in the origin of Steve Rogers up to this point or this new origin of Steve Rogers up to this point and the role they play. That's absolutely it. Now, the funny thing about this is Steve Rogers says, this is an absolute certainty. I know these things to be true, but the history of Helmut Zemo in terms of him leading the Thunderbolts and things like that, that's still intact. And so what Steve Rogers basically says here is, look, your history is the history that I remember. Your history is of the two of us being friends. Your history is of you being at my side almost every step of the way. The issue is that Helmut Zemo does not remember any of that. And so what Nick Spencer is saying is that somewhere between the time that this new origin was established with Helmut Zemo and up until now, someone did something that changed Helmut Zemo's mind, that changed his memories. And so again, there's a lot of forces being pulled here. There's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of information that Nick Spencer is just kind of trickling in and leaving a lot of questions to be answered. And so again, it's not necessarily that I'm just leaving information out for you guys. It's that Nick Spencer hasn't necessarily answered that. Now, this is a good and a bad thing. With this story basically being a one shot to set the stage for, you know, the Secret Empire rising, the prelude to the actual Secret Empire event itself. For those of us who are wildly interested in Captain America Steve Rogers, it keeps us coming back. For those who are just now getting into it, for those who are seeking answers or those who are continuity sticklers, it raises problems and it could turn them off to the story. So again, it's just the, the gamble that you take when you're writing a comic book and it's the risk that Nick Spencer is willing to go on here. But for me as a reader of Captain America Steve Rogers, I love it because it keeps me asking the question, why doesn't Helmut Zemo remember the same history that Steve Rogers remembers? Why did things change? What happened? What did somebody do here? But what Steve Rogers ends up saying is that whether or not Helmut Zemo remembers his own past, his very actions have basically guaranteed the fact that the history that Steve Rogers is spouting is accurate. And the reason why is because we know that over the course of his life, Helmut Zemo formed the Thunderbolts, a team that was basically villains masquerading as heroes and then eventually becoming heroes themselves. Of course, basically being a Civil War implementation from 2006 when the first Civil War story was written. Over the course of its publication history, Helmut Zemo was always part of the uh, of the Thunderbolts, eventually brand, uh, branched off, reformed Hydra or joined Hydra rather, took over the organization. And so it was basically Steve Rogers saying, you've always been a part of Hydra. It's just somebody made you forget. But just by virtue of your subconscious, because your subconscious knows it to be true.
true. You ended up coming back home anyway. You just don't know why. And so because of this, Steve Rogers says, look, in order for you to trust me, I have to be able to show that I trust you. And so where Helmut Zemo had basically been held as a prisoner, you know, to a degree, Steve Rogers effectively lets all the guard down and says, okay, you're a free man. If you do not believe me, walk away. But if you believe me, join my side. And that's exactly what Helmut Zemo does. He joins the side of Steve Rogers and the two of them go forward with the intention of basically bringing down the Red Skull. Now, because of the fact that the Thunderbolts team, as it had been reformed by Bucky Barnes in all new, all different Marvel, had essentially gone underground, with Bucky Barnes being so good at staying hidden, something that was verified during the events of Civil War, which is why he was not part of the first Civil War event, despite the fact that he had returned, the Thunderbolts are basically missing in action. No one knows where they are. And so because of this, with the new version of Quasar having cosmic awareness, meaning that as long as something is tied into the Marvel cosmology, Quasar can sense where they are. Quasar actually senses the location of Kabak. And this is when uh, Quasar basically says, we have to contact Steve Rogers. We have to let him know where Kabak is. And so again, it's Nick Spencer grabbing a lot of these different themes and pulling them together, basically saying that this is all leading to this revelation that people are going to start learning what Steve Rogers is, the fact that he's actually a Hydra agent. And the final little bit of uh, information that he gives us is the first person to learn the identity of Steve Rogers, who comes in the form of Taskmaster. Now, Taskmaster, historically speaking, has always been a B or C list level character. He's got a fan base and he's got a rabid fan base, but Taskmaster is probably someone you would never see in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I wouldn't be surprised if right now you're scratching your head and you have no idea who Taskmaster is. Taskmaster is basically a guy who operates behind the scenes 90% of the time, but he is the foremost fighter when it comes to Marvel Comics. His ability in terms of fighting his prowess allows him to actually mimic the fighting styles of other people, assuming for whatever reason he didn't know it. But Taskmaster knows almost every single fighting style in existence. He's trained people like Crossbones on how to fight. He's trained a multitude of individuals on how to be extremely good combatants in hand-to-hand -hand combat. But the fact that Taskmaster is basically analyzing the original footage when Steve Rogers killed Jack Flagg, which we saw in the first story arc of Captain America Steve Rogers, which you'll find down in the description, Taskmaster basically overhears the statement that Steve Rogers makes when he says, Hail Hydra. And so this is basically Taskmaster coming to the realization that Captain America is a Hydra agent. And so of course the question becomes now, what does he do with this information? Does he intend to blackmail Steve Rogers? And if so, what could he hope to achieve out of it? Does he just throw the information out into the, you know, for the world to see? That's the question that's being answered. And again, this is all leading up to Secret Empire. It's all leading up to the various superheroes across the Marvel Universe, all becoming aware of the fact that Captain America, Steve Rogers, the champion of superheroes across the Marvel Universe is actually a Hydra agent. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. It's just a quick little one shot. Hopefully I didn't throw too much information at you guys. I tried to, you know, phrase it in a way that made sense. Try to keep you guys abreast of everything that's going on. If you guys have any questions though, feel free to post them down in the comment section. But if you are new here to Comics Explained, be sure to hit the sub button to become part of the Rob. And uh, yeah, leave a like if you enjoy this video and I will catch you all later. Peace.